Zechariah chapter 9, verse 9 says, Rejoice greatly, O daughter of Zion. Shout, O daughter of Jerusalem. Behold, thy king cometh unto thee. He is just, and having salvation, lowly and riding upon an ass, and upon a colt, the foal of an ass. King has promised to meet with us. We have reason to believe that he is faithful to his promises. Well, let's stand together and uh, rejoice in that faith that he's given us to believe him. We're going to sing the hymn on the back of your uh, bulletin. So let's stand together, Brother Tom. Good morning. Would you turn to the book of Mark, chapter 6? Book of Mark, chapter 6. We're going to read verse 1. I'm just so overwhelmed with Thanksgiving this morning that the Lord would purpose to draw me here this morning and to hear his gospel, to send his Holy Spirit, to bless the word. Just doesn't seem like too long ago, Brother Greg. We used to be like those millions. Look forward to that one day a year to solve our conscience. Check A, B, C, and D, and off we went on our way to hell. And yet here, here I am this morning by his sovereign mercy and grace. And to enjoy the love of the brethren. <laughs> We're blessed beyond. Verse 1. Chapter 6. And he went out from thence, from Capernaum, and came into his own country, of Nazareth, where he grew up. And his disciples follow him. And when the Sabbath day was come, he began to teach in the synagogue. And many hearing were astonished. I'm glad it didn't say all, but many, because there are few that are chosen. 
many are called, saying, From whence hath this man these things? And what wisdom is this which is given unto him, that even such mighty works are wrought by his hands? Is not this the carpenter, the son of Mary, the brother of James and Joseph and of Judah and Simon, and are not his sisters here with us? And they were offended at him. Now, the Jews in that day thought that the Messiah would come from kingly royalty or, you know, in John 6, when the Lord said that he was the bread of life that came down from heaven to give us life unto the world, these were their comments saying, how, how can he being a lowly carpenter? We know him. Nothing's changed. Nothing has, nothing's changed today. The world hates the Lord Jesus Christ. They do. They're not offended with the babe in the manger or the one that does miracles and signs and wonders. But you tell them that he's God, absolutely sovereign, that we have no claims on him, that he can do whatsoever he pleases with our soul. They hate the Lord Jesus Christ who died according to the scriptures, who rose again according to the scriptures. That one they hate. But not if you're a sinner. Oh, no. This morning, he was delivered up for my offenses and your offenses. And he rose again for our justification. It, he took upon our sins. We offended him. We robbed him of his glory. We crucified him. We don't hate him. We love him because he first loved us. It's a work of grace if you're a sinner. But Jesus said unto them, A prophet is not without honor, but in his own country, and among his own kin, and in his own house. It is true, the Lord said, the enemies are from your own household. They truly are. They know you better than anybody else. And when you say that, he said that, uh, he came unto his own, and his own knew him not. And then he said that, uh, but to many as received him, gave he the power to become the sons of God, to everyone that believeth on his name. You tell them that, and you tell them that it's not blood, nor the will of the flesh, nor the will of man, but of God. Everything is of God. That's why they hate you. That's why they hate me. And he could do there no mighty work, save that he laid his hands upon a few sick folk and healed them. Are there any sick here this morning that need to be healed? I need to be healed. I need my sin to be put away. And here's the verse, verse 6. And he marveled because of their unbelief. Not that he was fooled by he Lord knows the hearts of men. This morning, he knows my heart, and he knows your heart. He knows. And if you believe him, it's because he's given you the faith to believe him. If you don't believe him, it's because he has not given you the faith to believe him. But that being said, if you're a believer, you know there's one thing that debilitates more than anything as we walk after Christ. is this thing of unbelief. The civil war that rages in between. You know what I'm talking about. Oh, Lord, help my unbelief. Give me more faith. And I want to close by encouraging. I heard a message this week that just spoke to this very thing. If you're here from Lexington, you've heard that message. It was in 2 Samuel 7, verse 25. Remember, the Lord just got through telling the prophet Nathan what he was going to do for David, that he was going to establish the house of David forever. And we know that David is a type of Christ. The last part of verse 20, you read it, the last part of verse 25, this is what David said to the Lord. And it's a plea of faith. He said, do as thou hast said. Do as thou 
has said. It's not presumptuous. What the Lord is telling you and I is, is to ask him from his word what he already said he has done. He said that if you confess your sins, I am faithful and just to forgive you all your sins and to cleanse you from all righteousness. If you ask it, you will receive it. If you find it, you will see it. And the door shall be open to you. If you come into the throne room of grace boldly in time of grace and need, he said, ask him because he's already said he's done it. And that's faith. That's plea of faith, looking to him, resting in him. I pray he would do that now. Lord, we come into your presence right now in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ, thy dear son. Lord, we are pleading with you this morning that you would do what you have said you've done. Asking that once again, that you would enable us to hear you and to see you and that you would give us faith to believe you. Lord, we desire to worship you in spirit and in truth, and we ask that you would send your Holy Spirit to do that. That you would once again give your gospel preacher, our brother, the power and the freedom to speak of Christ and to lift him up that you may draw all men to him. Lord, thank you for drawing us here this morning. Thank you for blessing your word. We ask, Lord, that, do you, that you would do a work of grace in our hearts. That we may believe you and rest in you. That you would get all the glory. And we ask it in Christ's name and for his sake. Amen. Let's stand together once again. We'll sing hymn number 176. Number 176. <clears throat>
Bree Weishi is going to bring some special music now. Would you open your Bibles with me again, please, to 2 Corinthians chapter 6. 2 Corinthians chapter 6. <clears throat> I've titled this message, Now. Now. N-O-W. Now. Truth is, now, I'm talking about right now. Right this very minute is the only time that you and I have to exercise faith, to believe God. It's right now. You've heard the road is road to hell is paved with good intentions, and it is. People plan on getting right with God and believing God tomorrow. No one's ever done it, ever. Faith has never been experienced tomorrow. Any more than anything else you could ever do tomorrow. Nothing's ever been done tomorrow. And the road to hell is also littered with the bones of regrets and, uh, and, and, and successes in reflecting upon yesterday. There's no promise that we'll even have tomorrow. And there's no sure evidence, there's no absolutely sure evidence in my heart that my faith yesterday was real faith. 
I can't look back to yesterday. I can't look back to an experience that I had years ago. I can't, I cannot look to anything other than looking unto Jesus right now. Now. And my prayer for us this morning is that the Lord will give us grace to look to him now. Now. It's the only time we have. And here's the, here's the glorious hope. As long as there's breath, there is now. In other words, what I'm saying to you is that if the Lord gives you faith to look to Christ now, then he will give you faith to look to Christ an hour from now. And uh, tonight, when you lie your head down on your pillow, that will be your now. And tomorrow morning, when you open your eyes and realize that you're alive for another day, that moment will be your now. And when you get back in the midst of the salt mines tomorrow and you have to struggle with the things of this world, those moments that you have tomorrow where God gives you breath and faith will be your now. You can't look to your past and you cannot look to the future. The only way faith can be experienced, the only way faith can be enjoyed is now. Right now. Right this very minute. What is it, 10 minutes after 11? Right now. Verse 20 of chapter 5, the apostle says, Now then, we are ambassadors for Christ, as though God did beseech you by us. We pray you, in Christ's stead, be reconciled with God. God has sent us as a voice of one crying in the wilderness to say to you, come to Christ, be reconciled to God. And the only way that's going to happen is if the Lord does a work of grace in our hearts. We know that. And yet the means by which he does that, the warrant, if you will, for coming to Christ is his command to come. His command to come. They put a warrant out for your arrest and they come, the police comes to your door and says, I've got a warrant here for your arrest. Your, your obligation to come is that warrant. And our warrant to come to Christ is the command that the Lord Jesus Christ gives to us to say, come. But you can't come yesterday. You can't come tomorrow. You can't come a minute ago, and you can't come a minute from now. The only way you can come is right now, right now. And the Lord sends his ambassadors to say to his people, come to Christ, come to Christ. And the hope that those ambassadors have And the hope that God's people have is knowing that those whom God has chosen in the covenant of grace, those for whom the Lord Jesus Christ shed his precious blood, those for whom the Spirit of God is working in their hearts, causing them, causing them to will and to do of his good pleasure, making them willing in the day of his power, they're going to come, every one of them. I'm confident of it. He's going to make us come to him. Verse 21, For God hath made Christ sin for us. God charged, imputed to credited all the sins of all God's people to our sin bearer so that he bore our sins in his body upon that tree and satisfied divine justice by the sacrifice of himself once and for all. God made him sin for us that we become the righteousness of God in him. When 
God charges, imputes, credits the righteous obedience of the Lord Jesus Christ to his people. Now look at verse 1, and here's our text, chapter 6. We then as workers together. Now you see the with him is in italics. Just leave it off. Doesn't need to be there. God's not dependent upon us to work with him. If I'm not faithful to preach the gospel, he'll raise up someone who is. He's going to redeem He's going to regenerate everyone that's been redeemed in Christ. He's going to do it. But we as workers together beseech you also that you receive not the grace of God in vain. Now what is it to receive the grace of God in vain? Well, we touched on a little bit in the first hour. To hear the gospel and not to believe it. To, to be outwardly religious and not have the Lord ever do a work of grace in our hearts. That's partly, certainly what he's talking about. Being convinced intellectually, if you will. Having an awareness of true things without having the truth. And the truth is that there's a whole lot of folks, and I stand before you as I'm, I'm talking from experience. You can possess a lot of truths, small t, plural, and not have the truth, capital T, singular. Oh, Lord, don't let me receive the grace of God in vain. Don't leave me to thinking that because I've cataloged some truths, because I can parrot some doctrine or recite some verses or show some outward evidence of being religious that I have the truth. Lord, don't leave me without Christ. The other thing he's talking about here is that, that once having received Christ, that the believer doesn't live with an emptiness in that relationship with Christ. If he's he's not looking to the Lord Jesus Christ through faith, then uh, the work of grace that's been done in his heart will leave him void. It'll leave him empty. Not of salvation. Not of salvation. Every child of God who's, who's experienced the grace of God knows exactly what I'm talking about right now. You have have experienced the absence of the awareness of the Lord Jesus Christ in your life because you were looking to the past or you were looking to the future and you weren't looking in faith to Christ. And the Lord's admonition to us is don't receive the grace of God in vain. Now, he's not talking about Um, being saved and then losing your salvation, that's certainly not possible. If we have Christ, the scripture makes it clear that we've passed from death unto life. And when the Lord gives life, it cannot be reversed. It cannot be taken away. We become partakers of his divine nature, having escaped the corruption of the world that is in the world through lust. We've, we've been delivered. We've been, we've been saved. The Lord doesn't save someone and then, and, then, and then send them to hell. He doesn't do it. We're born again. Born of God. Not of corruptible seed. Not of the will of man. Not of the will of the flesh. But of incorruptible seed by the word of God. That's the means by which the Lord gives us the new birth. And that can't be changed. That can't ever be made vain. He said, I will make my abode with you. I will sup with you. 
and you with me. He dwells in us and we dwell in him. And that's an eternal union that can never be changed. That's my hope. That's my hope. Verse 2, for he saith, and this is a quote from Isaiah chapter 49, for he saith, I have heard thee in a time accepted, and in the day of salvation have I succored or helped thee. Turn with me to Isaiah 49. Isaiah 49. All of Isaiah 49 is a glorious declaration of God's promise to reward the Lord Jesus Christ for his faithfulness. For his faithfulness. That's, that's, that's our hope. <laughs> our hope is not in uh, our faithfulness. Our hope is in his Look at Psalm 49, verse 1. Listen, O isles, unto me, and hearken ye people from far. The Lord hath called me from the womb, the bowels of my mother hath he made mention of my name. Now, most of the times in the scriptures where a child is named, well, the tradition was that it was named at the time of circumcision, which was the eighth day. So the John, you remember with Zacharias, was going to was was made deaf because he wasn't he wasn't um, able to speak and 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 it was at John's circumcision that it was made clear that John's name was to be made John. Jacob, when he was born, was called the supplanter because he was holding on to the heel of Esau. And Esau was called Esau because he was red. And so children that were waited until they were born before a name was given to them, a name that was appropriate to their situation or to their character. The name that God gave to the Lord Jesus Christ was given to him before he was born. The angel made it clear To Joseph, you shall call his name Jesus. Why? For he shall save his people. He's going to accomplish the salvation of his people. Contrary to what most folks believe, the Lord Jesus Christ did not come into this world to make an offer of salvation for which you make effectual by something you do. A decision you make, a work you perform Whatever. No, he shall save his people. And when he bowed his mighty head on Calvary's cross, having suffered the full wrath of God's justice for all the sins of all God's people, he cried with a loud voice, It is finished. It's finished. I've accomplished it by the sacrifice of myself, all by myself on Calvary's cross. What does faith do? Faith looks to Christ. Faith believes on the Lord Jesus Christ. Faith rests in him. And that can only be done right now. Right now. As an ambassador of God, I am beseeching you, believe on the Lord Jesus Christ. Rest all the hopes of your immortal soul on his glorious person and on his accomplished work and look nowhere other than to Christ for your salvation. That's what the Lord's telling us in 2 Corinthians chapter 6. Verse 2 of Isaiah 49, And he hath made my mouth a sharp sword. The Lord Jesus Christ, his his tongue is a sharp sword. Oh, and it cuts. It's a double-edged sword. It wounds and it heals. It kills and it gives life. It's, It's talking about his word. 
The means by which the Lord gives faith. As we saw in the previous hour, faith comes by hearing and hearing comes by the word of God. This is the means. He hath made my mouth like a sharp sword in the shadow of his hand. Hath he hid me and made me a polished shaft. That's an arrow. In his quiver hath he hid me. The Lord Jesus Christ belongs to the Father. God sent him as the Christ, the Messiah, in the full power of the Spirit of God. And never a man spake like this man before. He speaks with authority. He speaks with conviction. He speaks with clarity. And when God speaks, he says, Thus saith the Lord. I'm so glad for that. I'm so glad that God didn't say, well, what do you think about this? <laughs> Faith just believes God. It believes God. Lord, give me faith right now to believe you. To not say, well, yeah, but. To not add any ifs, ands, or buts to the word of God. Lord, shut me up to your word and cause me to believe you right now. Right now. He said unto me, Thou art my servant. And the Lord Jesus Christ is being called Israel here. He's the prince. He said unto me, Thou art my servant, O Israel, in whom I will be glorified. Then I said, I have labored in vain. I have spent my strength for naught and in vain. What else could he have said? The first part of verse 4 is exactly what the Lord Jesus Christ said from the cross when he said, My God, my God, why hast thou forsaken me? He was forsaken of everyone. His friends forsook him. God Almighty forsook him. The angels could not come. He said, I could call 12 legions of angels to come deliver me. You remember what a legion was? 6,000 angels. 6,000 is in a legion. I could call 12 legions of angels. All the angels in glory sat with their, stood with their, with their swords drawn ready to come deliver the Lord Jesus Christ from Calvary's cross. All he had to do was say a word, but he didn't. He didn't speak a word. He was forsaken by all, cut off from heaven. Why? His death was necessary to satisfy God's holy justice. He had to die in order for our sins to be put away. What made his death effectual? What made the death of the Lord Jesus Christ effectual? What made it successful in, in satisfying the demands of God Almighty? What made his death effectual? What made him successful is what distinguishes him unique from all other men. What was there about the Lord Jesus Christ that made him Utterly unique from every other person that's ever been born. I'll tell you what it was. And it's seen in the second half of this verse. Look. I have spent my strength for naught and in vain. Yet surely my judgment is with the Lord and my work with my God. Here's what made the Lord Jesus Christ utterly unique from you and me. He believed God with all of his heart every moment of his life. He had perfect faith. Perfect faith. God was, God's pleased when, 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 when we believe him. <laughs> and the Lord Jesus Christ believed God even when he was forsaken by the Father. Even when he was cut off, as the scripture says, from the land of the living. Even when he was cast outside the city. Even when he was denied of his, of his friends. He believed God. 
perfectly. In the moment. Every moment. Can you say that about yourself? No. Oh, I want to believe. Hey, go back with me to our text. Look at verse 2 of 2 Corinthians chapter 6. For he saith, I have heard thee in a time accepted, and in the day of salvation have I helped thee. Now that's God speaking to the Lord Jesus Christ, and that's a quote from Isaiah chapter 49. Go back with me, flip back over to Isaiah 49 verse 8. Thus saith the Lord, in an accepted time have I heard thee, and in the day of salvation have I helped thee. Why did God hear the Lord Jesus Christ? Because he believed God. He believed God. He trusted God. He was faithful to the Father. And the Father rewarded him for his perfect faith. 2 Corinthians chapter 6. For he saith, I have heard thee in a time accepted. God accepted the sacrifice that he made of himself because he made it in perfect faith to the Father. God's pleased. Whatever is not of faith is sin. The Lord Jesus Christ was utterly unique in that he never sinned because he had perfect faith every moment Every moment of his life. Now God can't be pleased with me and you. Except that we be found in him. That we be found in him. Not having our own righteousness which is of the law. But that righteousness which is by the faith of Jesus Christ. We're looking to Christ and his faithfulness to God as the hope of our salvation. God says to the Lord Jesus Christ, I've accepted you. In an accepted time, I heard you. Why? Because you believed me. Even when I forsook you, even when I cut you off, even when I made it look like everything that you were doing was in vain, even when it looked like to the world that Satan had gotten the victory and all had forsaken you and God Almighty himself had cut you off, you believed me in that hour and to his dying breath, the last thing the Lord Jesus Christ said from the cross, Father, into thy hands I commend my spirit. And he gave up the ghost. (laughs) Now that's what God requires, perfect faith. Isaiah 49, verse 5. And now saith the Lord that formed me from the womb to be his servant... To bring Jacob again, though Israel be not gathered, yet shall I be glorious in the eyes of the Lord, and my God shall be my strength. He came unto his own, his own received him not. Natural Israel didn't believe him. Spiritual Israel will. Every one of them. Every one of them. Why? Because he came to bring Jacob He came to bring the supplanters. He came to make those who are at enmity with God. He came to make them the princes of God. That's what he came to do. Did he accomplish what he came to do? Or did he just make an offer of salvation like the world would have you to believe? Is he in the heavens wringing his hands? Wishing that men would let him have his way? That's the Jesus I hear people talk about. Oh, won't you let Jesus come into your heart? Won't you let... He wants to save you. He's doing his best. He just can't quite get it done without your help. That's not the one I read about in the scriptures. That, my friend, is another Jesus. He's a figment of men's imagination. He is an idol. He doesn't exist and he cannot save. He cannot save. 
Come now to the one who is glorious in his person and powerful in his purpose to save everyone he came to save. Come to him right now. Right now. And he said, verse 6, It is a light thing that thou shouldest be my servant to raise up the tribes of Jacob and to restore the preserved of Israel. I will also give thee for a light to the Gentiles that thou mayest be my salvation unto the ends of the earth. <laughs> the Lord God Almighty is speaking in Isaiah 49 to the Lord Jesus Christ and saying, I'm going to give you even those Gentile dogs. As your inheritance. Everyone I've chosen in the covenant of grace. They're all going to come. They're going to believe. Verse 7. Thus saith the Lord. The redeemer of Israel. And his holy one. To whom man despiseth. To him whom the nations abhorreth. To a servant of rulers. Kings shall see and arise. Princes also shall worship because of the Lord that is faithful and the Holy One of Israel, and he shall choose thee. He's faithful. All right, go back with me to 2 Corinthians chapter 6. I began by saying that faith can only be experienced now. You have no confidence that the faith you had yesterday was real. No, you can't prove that. You can't, and, and, and you can't anticipate God giving you faith tomorrow. So when the Lord says, don't receive the grace of God in vain, and then he uses the Lord Jesus Christ as an example of perfect faithfulness. Perfect faithfulness. And what distinguishes him from you and me is that he believed God with all his heart all the time. All the time. That's not like us, is it? <laughs> oh, Lord, help thou mine unbelief. I'm so full of it. So now look what he says. I have heard thee in a time accepted, and in the day of salvation have I succored thee. I've helped thee. The, I, I've, because you were faithful to me, I heard thee. Now what hope do we have that God's going to hear us? The only hope we have is that we're looking in faith to the one who was perfectly faithful. And so he concludes this verse with, Behold, in light of all of this, look. That word behold means, uh, oh, uh, amazed. I see something I've never seen before. Now is the accepted time. The only time that God will accept your faith is right now. Right now. Now is the day of salvation. Right now. That's what the Lord's saying to us. I beseech you, as an ambassador for Christ, come to Christ right now, just like you are. Oh, no, well, you know, I need to get something worked out. No, you don't. No, you don't. What do you think you're going to improve your position? You think you're going to get something cleaned up or something fixed or some, something worked out that's going, to, that's going to make you more redeemable? Your redemption is based on the faithfulness of the Lord Jesus Christ. That's what this passage is telling us. God heard him. And his prayers were accepted because they were given in perfect faith. So now you come. Because now is the accepted time. Now is the day of salvation.
Paul said, I'm not yet apprehended that which has apprehended me. This thing of faith, I'm still, I'm still, one day I'm going to see him as he is. I'm not going to need faith anymore. I'm going to be made like him. Faith, hope, and love, and the greatest of these is love because there won't be any more need for faith and there won't be any more need for hope. My faith will be my sight and my hope will be my experience and the only thing I'm going to have is the glorious love of Christ. But right now, I'm struggling with this thing called faith. But this one thing I do, forgetting those things which are behind Forgetting all my successes, forgetting all my experiences. Oh, I can't tell you how many times I've heard somebody say, well, you know, I remember when I got saved. And I, and I, and I came down the aisle and I wept and I prayed and I just had this euphoric experience of salvation. And they're looking back to that as their salvation. You can't have faith in that experience. You don't know if that experience was real. You don't know. Maybe you were just emotional that day. You have no confidence that that experience was real. The only time you can believe God is right now. Now is the accepted time. Now is the day of salvation. This one thing I do, forgetting those things which are behind, I press right now towards the mark for the prize of the high calling in Christ Jesus. Come to Christ right now. And when you leave here and get in your car and you're driving down the road, come to Christ right now. And when you go to bed tonight, come to Christ right now. And as long as there's breath, there will be a now. But don't rely on your yesterday experiences. You remember what happened when the children of Israel were given manna from heaven? And uh, the Lord told them, only gather enough for one day. Oh, Lord, give me this day my daily bread. And some of them didn't believe God. And so they gathered a little extra just in case the manna didn't come tomorrow. And when they woke up in the morning to look at the extra manna that they had gathered up... It was full of worms. It was rotten, stinking. And that's what yesterday's faith was. Yesterday's grace. It was yesterday. It's past. It's gone. Now is the accepted time. Now is the day of salvation. Come to the Christ who is perfectly faithful to God. The only one that God is pleased with. The only one that succeeded in establishing perfect righteousness and and satisfying the justice of God through his sacrificial death on Calvary's cross. He's the faithful one. He's faithful and he's true. But come to him right now. And when you wake up in the middle of the night, it'll be a now. And next week, when you find yourself between a rock and a hard place, that'll be a now. Now is the, there's no time other than now. Don't you know that that man who, who said to, he said to his soul, he said, I'm increased with goods. <laughs> He said, I'm going to tear down my barns and I'll be bigger barns and I'll store all my goods. Don't you know that he was intending to get right with God tomorrow? Sure he was. Let me take care of my material wealth now and I'll worry about my soul later. And God said, thou fool this night, thy soul shall be required of thee. You can't get saved tomorrow. (laughs) You, You can't believe God tomorrow. You can't come to Christ tomorrow. Now is the accepted time. Now is the day of salvation. Right now. Oh, how much 
of our lives, we live in the past and in the future. Isn't that our experience? Regretting our mistakes, fretting over the things that we've done, or glorying in our successes, or worrying about the possibilities of tomorrow, most of which never come to pass. What does God say? Behold, now is the accepted time. Behold, now is the day of salvation. Can you join me in asking God? And let me, let me, there's not a prayer I pray more than, Lord, save me. We don't talk about getting saved as if it was a one-time experience. Lord, this is, this is, we walk by faith, not by sight. Can you join me in asking the Lord right now? Right now. No one was ever saved tomorrow. And you've got no sure evidence that what you believed yesterday was sufficient for the salvation of your soul. Come to Christ right now. Otherwise, the grace of God is in vain to you. Let's pray. Our Heavenly Father, we ask that you would use the call of your Spirit to bless your word And cause us to come right now. We ask it in Christ's name. Amen. 334 334 in in the hymnal. Let's stand together. Oh. Uh-huh.